Good afternoon, and welcome to the first webinar in our new series for entrepreneurs. My name is Lisa Friedersdorf, and I'm the director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. This webinar series is one of the activities we support for the new Nanotechnology Entrepreneurship Network, or NEN. The NEN brings new and seasoned entrepreneurs together with the people and resources available to support them. This emerging network provides a forum for sharing best practices for advancing nanotechnology commercialization and the lessons learned along the technology development pathway. A key stop along the technology development pathway is protecting the underlying intellectual property. Entre entrepreneurs intending to commercialize an emerging technology such as a nanomaterial or a nanotechnology-enabled product need to be aware of the intellectual property issues that might impact their business. In this webinar, we welcome guests from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Elizabeth Doherty is the Eastern Regional Outreach Director, and Craig Morris is the Managing Attorney for Trademark Educational Outreach. And with that, I will turn it over to Elizabeth to get things started. Great, and thank you, Lisa. It's really a pleasure to be here on behalf of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, we enjoy the opportunity to get out and to speak with our stakeholders um, and to speak with such a unique community, that of the nanotechnology space. Nanotechnology is certainly becoming ubiquitous within the practice um, and certainly across technologies, and we're seeing it in more and more applications each and every day. So we're excited to have the opportunity to work with your network and to provide what is really today a very initial conversation about the importance of intellectual property. I'm afraid in our hour today, we're really just going to scratch the surface of what is intellectual property, some of the basics of intellectual property. Um, and I guess I'd like to say, just starting out, that I think um, for myself, and I think I can speak for my colleague Craig, that three of our key takeaways are that protecting your intellectual property is, in fact, an important business strategy. And for anyone who's looking to start and build and grow a business, it's a business strategy that should be present in your business thinking from the very get-go, from the very beginning. It shouldn't be a rainy day project. It's not a project to get to when you have more time or money. Because oftentimes by uh, preventing or delaying and protecting your intellectual property, you could, in fact, preclude yourself from protecting your intellectual property. So we encourage people to think of it very early on in the process. Um, second, I would suggest that we want to also touch on the fact that there are different forms of intellectual property, and they are each uh, protected by very different vehicles. Today, we'll touch on patents and trademarks primarily because we are the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, but there are also copyrights, which are administered by the Copyright Office, which is found as a part of the Library of Congress, and there are trade secrets, which are generally protected by contract law uh, or state law. Um, and third, and uh, finally, I think one of the other takeaways I'd love for our audience to appreciate today is that there are numerous resources available through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and our partners and collaborators that are there to assist people who are getting started in uh, protecting their intellectual property. Um, and we'll talk about some of those during our presentation today. And let me also mention, with respect to these resources, many of them uh, reflect my favorite four-letter word, and that is free. Many of these resources are free, so I, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to touch on some of them so people are aware that they exist. But with that, let's go ahead and jump right into the material because I know our time is limited, and we want to also encourage questions as we go along. So, in fact, what is intellectual property? Um, intellectual property is that property that is created by the mind. Um, it's whether you're creating an invention, a poem, a logo. These are all things that we have created, and they're in opposition to real property. When we talk about real property, we're talking about a house, a car, a boat, something that one has ownership of that is protected in another form. Um, when we think about owning a home or a car, it's often uh, protected by a deed. It's often protected by some type of a contract. Uh, differently, intellectual property is property that is created by an individual or an organization and, in fact, starts as an idea and then builds into something that is, in fact, protectable. Um, where does the thought of protecting intellectual property in the United States come from? Well, in fact, it comes from the Constitution itself. 
The founding fathers of our country, when creating the Constitution of the United States, recognized that in order to build a strong and growing industrialized nation, that it was going to be important to protect for authors and inventors for a limited period of time, their ability to protect their writings and discoveries. So we find language in the Constitution itself that protects both patents and copyrights. And Craig can address the fact that trademarks are in there too. Um, so as we see, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 provides that the Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times, and that limited times is going to be important to authors and inventors, the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. In fact, on an interesting historical note, this is the only place where one will find the word right in the U.S. Constitution. That's here in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, where we set forth the protection of patents and copyrights. Um, on another interesting historical note, for those of you who are considering applying for a patent, uh, we have recently, a little over a year ago, issued patent number 10 million, and this is something that we've been doing since 1790. The U.S. Patent Office, prior to becoming the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, um, is arguably one of the oldest federal agencies, and again, have been at our work since 1790. So as I mentioned right up front, it's important to note that uh, protecting your intellectual par property should be part of your business strategy. And why is that? Um, and how does that go about? Well, if we see from this graphic, the cycle of innovation, um, there are many different facets to the cycle of innovation, starting with creating that new idea, and then what does one do with that new idea? You seek funding, research and development, developing your IP strategy. These are all pieces of a critical puzzle, that puzzle where you take that idea and then you hope to bring it to the marketplace and be successful in creating a business and perhaps going on to, in fact, build an industry. Now, why is IP strategy a business strategy? That's because IP is an asset. It's an asset for any business. For those of us who have ever seen Shark Tank, and when I speak to an audience, invariably there's always a number of people in the audience who raise their hand that they've seen Shark Tank. And what is one of the first questions that the sharks always ask? It's have you protected whatever that product is they're bringing forward? Have you protected your intellectual property? Lori Grenier, one of the sharks, in fact, has over 150 patents in her own name. She is an inventor and is a very strong proponent of the patent system. So IP is also important for increasing your leveraging power. It creates that portfolio that you can bring forward to a company that ha if you are trying to leverage financing, if you are trying to attract investors. So it is a property right, and it is global. Um, we will talk about a little bit today. Again, this is a very introductory course, but we will talk about the fact that intellectual property is global. Now, that does not mean to suggest that um, there is a worldwide patent, because, in fact, there is not. Patents are territorial. Patents only protect an invention for the country in which they are issued. Now, with that said, one can protect your invention across the globe. There are a number of different vehicles and a number of different intellectual property offices, um, but it's a great conversation to have with a registered patent attorney or patent agent. Um, because while one could protect globally in each and every country across the globe, that's a very expensive proposition. Um, and one where there might be a strategy behind where you would like to file. So in developing your IP strategy, it's important to assess your company's IP assets and prioritize. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you may be creating an IP portfolio, and that portfolio may consist of patents, and it could consist of not only multiple patents, but it could consist of multiple types of patents, utility, design, plant, even provisional patent applications. Note that I say provisional patent applications because there is no such thing as a provisional patent. Important to note. Know what your competition is and what they're up to. And this could be important both when uh, looking to the innovations that you're creating, but also where you want to file to protect your intellectual property. What is the pace of growth and innovation and opportunities for growth? Interestingly, we would argue or suggest that the majority of patents that are issued are for improvement technologies. 
Um, in fact, it's been said anecdotally that 99% of the patents that are issued are for improvement technology, meaning that someone is building upon an existing technology. Um, you, uh, you know that a two-wheel bicycle uh, works really well, but you think perhaps if I add a third wheel, it'll be even more efficient and I can cover more ground more quickly. That would be an improvement, an improvement upon an existing technology. It's argued that only 1% of patents that are issued are for disruptive technology. Now, this is a conversation for another day, but certainly an interesting point to consider because the wealth of information that is located in U.S. patents, U.S. patent applications that are published, and the, the patents that are available worldwide is really an incredible wealth of information. Um, and one in which we are able to build upon. And really one of the, the inherent beauties of the patent system is that by disclosing these inventions to the public, we are all able to gain and to benefit from them and to build upon them. So uh, again, kind of taking a historical perspective, how tangible are your assets? This is just an interesting note that uh, in previous times, a company might have listed its most important assets. I'm sorry, I think that I'm on the wrong slide. Let's get that advanced. See if we can get that forward. Which seems to be a glitch in our slides. My apologies if you'll hang with us for just one moment. So to continue the conversation while we're trying to advance the slide, um, the slide would indicate that approximately 50 years ago that um, if a company were to list its primary assets, they would really be hard assets, factory, equipment, inventory. Today, oftentimes companies consider their most valuable assets to be more intangible things, designs, processes, inventions, algorithms, brands, things that are protected by intellectual property. And that's the importance of our conversation today. Seems that we're still having a challenge advancing our slides. Oh, so maybe in fact you are seeing something very different than I am. Just give us one second. Please. Well, we're waiting for your slides. I just wanted to, um, you, you mentioned several different types of, of patents. So when uh, an inventor or an entrepreneur is, is developing a new product, um, how, how do they think about, you know, an early stage patent versus when, when they've completed the entire process? Do you understand what I, I mean? I, I see what you're getting at, Lisa, and it's a great question. So um, this will actually jump us into uh, the part of the presentation, I, I think importantly, where we talk about provisional patent applications and non-provisional patent applications. Um, before we get to that content, maybe we could touch just very quickly on the different types of patents, utility, design, and plant. Do we think we're synced? So when individuals are thinking about filing a U.S. patent application, um, most frequently what we receive are utility patent applications. And utility patent applications cover the majority of what we think inherently as inventions, a bicycle, a cell a cellular communication device, a new chemical composition. It protects something, um, it can protect the chemical composition, the method of manufacture, um, the article of manufacture. Uh, it can also protect business methods and methods of doing business. Um, our design patents protect the ornamental appearance of an article of manufacture. So interestingly, when we talk about utility patents and design patents, those are often secured by an inventor hand in hand or uh, in a similar process. They are two different forms of intellectual property, two different types of patent, and require two different patent applications. They can oftentimes work together to provide great value in protecting an invention. So let's take, for example, um, a cell phone, a cellular communication device. Um, in all likelihood, the components of that cell phone are protected by hundreds, if not thousands, of utility patents. 
the chips that are within um, the, the phone, the various components of the phone itself. But then it may also be protected by a design patent, which protects the ornamental appearance of that cellular communication device. So whether one's inventing a new mailbox or a new cellular communication device, oftentimes people will create this patent portfolio to protect all of the various aspects of that particular device. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump. Um, the next slide is how do I get value from my IP? Some of these are very intuitive, and I'll leave, the, leave these for you to review um, at a later time. Um, IP, again, let's boil it down just to say that IP can be used in a number of ways to bring value to you as an individual, you as a company, you as an organization, because it can be used similar to real property as an asset. So let's talk about patents themselves. So what is a patent? And I'm, I'm sure that many of you in our audience today, and many of you who may be listening to this at a later date, are very familiar with a patent, and hopefully you have many of them. Hopefully you're one of our frequent flyers and uh, have received a number of U.S. patents. But for those of you who are not as familiar, U.S. patent is a property right granted by the United States government to an inventor. Our system is what we call a quid pro quo system where in exchange for the inventor disclosing to the public, disclosing their invention with such specificity that others can make and use their invention, the government is willing to protect their right, is, is willing to give them the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, or selling the invention throughout the United States or importing for a limited period of time. We just touched briefly on utility patents and design patents. Utility patents currently, under current U.S. law, protect an invention for 20 years from the date of filing that application. Design patents protect an invention for 15 years from the date of issuance of the patent. So again, going back to one of our very initial talking points, that there are different forms of intellectual property, that they protect very different things, they oftentimes have very different terms. So it's important as you create your portfolio, to be aware of that there are different forms with different terms um, and to keep track of those. Uh, we won't talk about it today, but when one has a utility patent, maintenance fees are required in order to keep that patent in force once you have received a U.S. patent. Um, as I mentioned, there is something uh, called copyrights. Um, again, we won't talk about those in any great depth today. They are handled by the U.S. Copyright Office, which is part of the Library of Congress. They do protect an original work of authorship, which is placed in a fixed and tangible medium. Um, trade secrets, uh, as I also referenced, are any information that derives economic value from not being generally known or ascertainable. Trade secrets are incredibly interesting in that trade secrets can protect an invention or some other form of value, valuable intellectual property as long as the information can be kept secret. So as we just mentioned, patents are for a limited period of time. As we said, that's put, put forth in the Constitution for a limited period of time, utility patents 20 years from the date of filing, design patents 15 years from the date of issuance, trade secrets, as long as one can maintain that information in secret, they can last forever. So think about that as you're creating your intellectual property. If you have something that you have created that you can maintain as a secret, either through employee regulations, employee contracts, um, consider it. Um, it's one of the valuable forms of intellectual property. So with that, let's actually start looking more at patents. As I mentioned, there are utility design and plant patents. I would suspect that many of you who are listening today or listening uh, to this uh, in, in the future will be pursuing either utility or design or, again, perhaps both. Um, when considering what type of patent to file, one needs to, to determine what it is you are trying to protect. And, uh, and that, that's really the key, the key question. Um, as I mentioned, for utility, it's new and useful processes, machines, articles of manufacture, compositions of matter, or any new and useful improvement. Again, remember we mentioned that 99% of patents that are issued are to improvement. So when one starts going down the patent path, 
there are some pre-filing decisions that should be considered. Should you in fact file an application? It is a significant endeavor to undertake. Um, when should you file? Where should you file? Now, where should I file really should be a question of whether you should file with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office or should you file abroad or both. Um, the majority of our applicants file electronically. While you can deliver a paper application, that's very infrequently done. What type of application to file? Again, are you seeking a utility design or plant protection? And who should prepare the application? These are all questions that one should be asking before undertaking this significant endeavor. The path to a patent generally begins with a new idea, or hopefully it is a new idea. Now, with that said, perhaps your idea is just so great someone has already thought of it. And this is where it's a good opportunity to consider the idea of doing a prior art search. In filing a provisional patent application or a non-provisional patent application, one is not required to do a prior art search, although it is strongly encouraged. Again, your idea may be just so great that someone else has already thought of it. Now, one can take the step of filing a provisional patent application. Uh, as the slide indicates, it is optional, but it is a very useful tool, and I'll tell you why. If one wants to seek a U.S. patent, however, one must file the non-provisional patent application. That is the document that is filed with the federal government that can result in a U.S. patent um, if your invention meets the criteria. So let's do a little bit deeper dive on that provisional versus non-provisional. The provisional application is something which is filed really as a placeholder with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. It is a document which is not examined nor published. And when I say it is not published, that means it is maintained in confidence within the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. It is only good for one year, and it is only available for utility patents. It allows an applicant to file for a low cost of entry and a relatively low barrier to entry, a document with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, which puts on notice that you are seeking or pursuing, perhaps, patent protection. By filing for a provisional patent application, one can begin to use the term provisional. Uh, uh, one can say patent pending. I'm sorry. One can use the term patent pending if a provisional application has been filed, and of course, certainly if a non-provisional. As I mentioned, if one does want to, in fact, seek a U.S. patent, you must file a non-provisional patent application. That is what is examined by one of our over 8,000 trained engineers and scientists who review the over 650,000 applications that we receive each year. These applications are published 18 months from the earliest filing date, and as I said, can become a patent if the standards are achieved. With respect to the provisional utility application, it is a low-cost way to establish an early effective filing date. Um, it does not issue as a patent, and again, it is only good for that one-year period. It can serve as the basis for your non-provisional application. And in fact, if one files a non-provisional patent application within the year of the provisional patent application, one is effectively achieving a 21-year patent. Um, so again, another benefit. Now, while one can use the term patent pending, while either a provisional patent application or non-provisional patent application is pending, one can really not pursue uh, in a court of law or pursue going after a competitor until a U.S. patent issues. Um, so just a point of notice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the provisional patent application is a patent application. It is not a patent because keep in mind, again, they are not something that is examined. Let's catch up um, from our slides. I'm sorry, I'm talking and not advancing slides at the right rate of speed. Um, as I mentioned, the provisional application can serve as the basis of priority for your non-provisional application, as well as for if filing a, a uh, application in a foreign country. But let's really get down to brass tacks here, because I, I see our, our time is going rapidly. Um, let's talk about the application, which can actually advance into a U.S. patent, because that's really what we're, we're hoping to achieve here and the information that we're hoping to deliver. So for that non, 
provisional patent application, there are filing requirements. In filing a U.S. patent application, we do follow a very specific form. And for anyone who has not looked at a U.S. patent, I would suggest and recommend that prior to considering filing a patent application or pursuing a U.S. patent, that one uh, look at patents that have issued in the field of endeavor in which you are inventing. One, because it not only uh, provides you with information as to what's happening in your space, in your field of technology, but it also allows you to see this format that I'm talking about. One must have a specification. One must have drawings. One must provide certain biographical information. Um, for a basic filing, one must provide a filing fee, a search fee, and an examination fee. When we talk about a U.S. patent and the scope of a patent, we're really in large part focusing on the claims of the application. As was uh, set forth in one of the significant patent cases of our generation, the claims are the name of the game. And that's where people are going to go to, first and foremost, to look at your patent to see exactly what you are protecting, what you have invented, and what is protected by your patent. So you're going to want to take great care in drafting the claims of your application. This might be a great place to take a step aside and answer the question, Does can one pursue a patent application on your own? And, and the answer is yes. Um, now, I will say with that yes, um, only about 3% of our applicants, in fact, do so. Um, and they are pro se applicants, individuals who file without the assistance of a patent attorney or patent agent. Now, some of them do it very, uh, very successfully. Um, so it's not to be discouraged. However, we do strongly encourage the use of a patent attorney or patent agent because this is a, it can be considered a complicated process and it is receiving a right from the federal government. So there are a number of hurdles to pass. As I mentioned, there's formats to comply with. And uh, the complexity of the process um, is, is not to be dismissed. So when one files a patent application, what happens? Well, it is received by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And again, um, it is distributed to one of our over 8,000 patent examiners. So I have to say, having been one of them for the first portion of my career, are individuals who are committed to serving the American people and who take their jobs very, very seriously. They are technologists, they are scientists and engineers from all backgrounds within uh, the scientific endeavors. Your application is received and that then allows us to begin the process of communication and collaboration. Because in fact, we want the same things that our inventors want. We want to issue them a valid U.S. patent if they are entitled to one. We are the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, not the U.S. Rejection Office. We want to issue you a patent if you are entitled to one, but we want it to be a patent that you can take to the bank and not to the courthouse. So with that said, we begin the process of back and forth with the applicant, and most usually it's through their patent attorney or patent agent. We begin to boil down the invention to what, in fact, may be uh, a patentable invention. This is where the examiner is going to look for whether the invention is novel, whether the invention is non-obvious, and whether the invention has a utility. Um, they will also look to ensure that it is subject matter eligible. In fact, is it something that is eligible to be protected by a patent? So these are all considerations that play into the patent examination process, um, the patent prosecution of your application. Now, um, in all hopes, uh, you receive a U.S. patent and you become one of our uh, over 10 million patents that are filling um, our world with new inventions to make our lives better and more efficient, more effective, and more fun. Once one receives a U.S. patent, it then falls to the rights holder to enforce that patent and to determine really what to do with it. Uh, my father has a patent. Um, he never commercialized that technology, but is extremely proud of the fact that that patent hangs on his wall. And for some people, that is enough. Um, but you may decide that you want to start and build and grow a company. You may decide that no, your, your heart or your passion is really in creating invention itself. So you may choose to license your technology to someone else to commercialize your technology. This, this is really, again, one of the beauties of our system, that one, as the patent right holder, 
you have so many choices as to what to do next. Well, as I see my time is very nearly up, I just want to hit some quick USPTO resources before I turn to my colleague, Craig, to talk to you about the importance of trademarks um, in protecting your intellectual property. Um, very quickly, I just want to alert you to the fact, because I'm sure some of you may be tuning in from outside of the Washington, D.C. metro area. We do have regional offices located in Detroit, Denver, Silicon Valley, and Dallas. And just as our Alexandria, Virginia headquarters, these offices all have resources and welcome you to come and visit. They also reach out into their community and enjoy doing direct stakeholder engagement. So if you have a company and you would like to have the USPTO come visit, whether from our regional office or from headquarters, um, we, we enjoy engaging with you. This is just a quick photo of our Alexandria headquarters where Craig and I are located. Um, we do have a public search facility there, um, as well as the National Inventors Hall of Fame Museum. So we encourage you to come and visit us in Alexandria. Skipping quickly past uh, the photo of myself, Let's talk very quickly about inventor and entrepreneur re resources. These are available on our website, and this is oftentimes where I tell people to get started if they're just beginning the journey of perhaps considering protecting intellectual property. This is available under our learning uh, pull-down tab and is available, again, under the heading inventor and entrepreneur resources. This is where there's some very basic information, some Q&A that you might find helpful, um, and some of the other things I'm going to touch on here just very quickly. Um, either from that page or from directly from our home page, I would encourage those of you who are located outside of the um, District of Columbia to visit the state page where you are located. That state page will directly link you to resources in your area, which include our Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. We have over 80 of these located at libraries across the nation. Um, they have a librarian or more than one librarian who is trained in patent and trademark searching. These resource centers often offer in-person training, um, offer consultations, and can help you establish a high-quality patent or trademark search based upon your idea. We do have a pro se assistance program, which helps those applicants who are filing without the assistance of a patent attorney or patent agent. And as I mentioned, uh, and these things that I've mentioned to you already are free, but we also really, let's get down to it, we also have the opportunity for people to take advantage of free legal assistance. We, in fact, um, as a result of the 2011 American Invents Act, have instituted in collaboration with partners across the nation pro bono programs uh, which are covering all of the 50 states, where for those inventors who are under-resourced and meet certain criteria, may take advantage of pro bono uh, legal assistance. One can find those on our state resource pages. Um, there are some criteria, because these resources are limited, people have to meet certain criteria, one of which is falling under a certain income cap. Uh, having some skin in the game, either through a provisional patent application or having taken a course on our website. Um, and they also have to have more than a mere idea. They actually have to have an invention that they can bring to the marketplace. Um, a corollary to our patent pro bono program is we also have law school clinical certification programs where we have law school uh, students supervised by a registered patent attorney or patent agent that are also able to offer reduced cost or free legal services. So if one is not able to take advantage of a pro bono program in their area, they may be able to apply to and receive assistance from a law school clinical program in their area. With that, I know I could talk to you all day about patents, um, but I don't want to be disrespectful of my colleague, Craig, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to him to talk to you about the joys of trademarks. Thank you very much, Liz. Whether you're the largest company in the world or the very smallest in the nanotechnology field, one thing is constant. If you hope to take your product to market, to commercialize, you're going to need a trademark. That's what we often say, that trademarks are the key to commercialization. Here are the five topics that I'm going to be covering. 
And the first really is the most basic. What is, in fact, a trademark or a service mark? Well, it's any word, symbol, design, combination of those things, that, and these are the buzzwords. Identify, identify the source of the goods and services, and second, to distinguish those from the goods or services of another party. So, summary, trademark, remember it's for goods or products, and a service mark, as the name suggests, is for services. Now, you've probably seen the symbols TM, the SM, the R, and a circle. Those symbols are not required, but they do put the public on notice as to rights that are being claimed. Now, the TM, the SM, they can be used at any time. You could leave today and start using the trademark symbol, the TM, or the service mark symbol, SM, because you're entitled to do so. The only thing that you are not to do is to use the R in a circle. That always means that, in fact, you've applied to seek federal registration and you were successful. Now, these are the basic types of marks, a word mark. And parenthetically, it says in slogan because the slogan is simply a longer form of a word mark. Now, that wording could be presented in a special form. They're Coca-Cola. You almost recognize that it is Coca-Cola by the way the lettering swoops together there. The third type is what we call a composite mark, consisting of both wording and a design element, or sometimes your mark may consist of simply a design. So it's a design mark. Now, those are the basic types of marks, but there are other types of marks as well. Here, a list of the other types of mark. Uh, configuration, uh, a sound mark, color, scent, motion, hologram. The basic thing tying all these together is that they serve the function of being a source identifier because that fundamentally is what a trademark is. It is a source identifier. Now, sometimes someone will say, you know, I don't think that I need a trademark because I already have my domain name registered. Well, a domain name is important in today's business environment, but it does not give the same rights as a trademark registration. Similarly, a business name, to do business in any state, you do need to have that name registered with the state office, but that does not give the same rights as a registered trademark. Now, what in fact are the benefits of federal registration? Well, before understanding the benefits of federal registration, you need to understand that there are rights flowing from the common law. Any trademark that is used in commerce in connection with specific goods or services will give what we call common law rights. Those are rights in the common law, but again, they are not registered. Now, common law rights are different from federal registration rights because they are limited to the geographic area in which the mark is being used. Now, you are able, even under the common law, to use the TM, the SM symbol, but again, you never use the R in a circle because that indicates that, in fact, you've successfully registered the mark at the USPTO. The last bullet there, an important consideration, is that the United States is a first-to-use country in terms of giving common law rights, while most other countries are based on a first-to-file. Now, what is the distinction between the common law and the federally registered trademark? Well, the federal registration gives you the legal presumption that you are the owner in all 50 states and the U.S. territories. But always remember, it is only within the federal system. It does not give you rights in any other countries. Here are some other points listed there. And continuing on. The last point there is sometimes very important depending on what the nature of your business. If you are aware of counterfeit goods coming into the country, it may be very helpful to have your U.S. trademark registration also recorded with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. That is the only way that they are able to keep counterfeit goods coming in. There must be 
a recorded U.S. trademark registration, recorded with U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Now, once you're aware that, in fact, it is a federally registered mark that you're ultimately interested in, it's important to consider what are the important topics when looking at selecting a mark. Well, first, you need to be aware that there are certain challenges. Not every mark is registrable, not every mark is enforceable, and again, always remember that even if a mark is registered, someone may claim superior rights based on common law, that claim being based on the fact that the mark was used first. Now, one of the things to be aware of when you're adopting a mark is that you need to be sure that you're avoiding a likelihood of confusion. Well, what is that? It is confusion as to the source of the goods or services. And we look at two very specific things. First, are the marks confusingly similar? They could be similar in sound. They could look alike. They could have similar meanings or create a similar commercial impression. And then second, and many people forget about this second part of the test, are the goods and or services somehow related? How could they be related? Well, for example, they could be encountered in the same channels of trade, or they could be complementary goods or services being used together in some manner. The important point being that identical trademarks can actually coexist in the marketplace because the goods or services simply are not related. Now, how do you avoid the possibility of a likelihood of confusion? Well, you have to do a trademark search. Well, one option is that you do this on your own, first using the USPTO database, that is the Trademark Electronic Search System, or TESS for short. Now, it's important to know, well, what does TESS actually show you? Well, it only shows you marks that are federally registered or applied for, contrasted with a search through the internet. Well, why would you be searching in the internet? It's because that is the only way to find common law use. Again, common law use based on use alone, not a registration. It will never show up in a search of the USPTO database. So to do a complete search, you need to also see what marks may be out there. And again, you're going to do that in the same way you search for many things today through the internet. Now, that's where you're trying to do a search by yourself, but of course there are other options. You could hire a private trademark attorney or a search firm because as listed here, they're going to do a much broader search, what we would call a full clearance search that really gives you a much better sense of is there a possible problem with the mark that you want to use. Now, in addition to avoiding a likelihood of confusion, you want to make sure that you are adopting a strong mark. Some marks are strong, other marks are weak, and if you have the opportunity, opportunity to adopt a strong mark, you certainly want to do so. The strongest marks are marks that are either fanciful or arbitrary. A fanciful mark is something like Xerox or Kodak, words that never existed in our language until someone created the mark to serve the function of being a source identifier. Again, a source identifier being a trademark. Because they were specifically created for that purpose, they are as strong as possible. An arbitrary mark is something like Apple for computers. It's obviously a real word, but the relationship between the mark and the goods, totally arbitrary. So also considered to be a very strong mark. A suggestive mark, slightly less strong, but still acceptable, that'd be something like copper tone for suntan lotion that suggests that if you use that lotion, your skin will turn a beautiful copper tone. Now going down in the spectrum there, suddenly you get to descriptive, now you're in trouble. A descriptive mark is a mark that on its face, it describes a characteristic, a quality, a function of the goods or services. Descriptive marks, they are difficult to register. They are difficult to protect. Not impossible, but because they are more problematic, you should always try to be at least above the line there. 
to be suggestive and even better to be fanciful or arbitrary. The absolute worst would be there at the bottom if you were to adopt a mark that would be considered generic. That is the actual name for the goods or services. So if you were coming up with a new dairy-based beverage, for example, you really couldn't say, and my trademark is milk. Milk, simply a generic for that product. And generic wording is never registrable as a mark. Now, once you've adopted a mark that you believe, again, no likelihood of confusion and it's going to be a strong mark, then we hope that you will file to seek federal registration. How are you going to do this? Well, you will do so through the Trademark Electronic Application System, or TEAS for short. As of February 15th of this year, you actually will not have an option other than filing through TEAS because electronic filing is going to become mandatory. Now, the basis for your filing may be one of several different options as listed here, the most common being used in commerce, interstate between the U.S. and another country, or you're also able to file based on intent to use. You have not used the mark yet, but you do plan to do so in the future. That allows you to file based on intent to use. You will have to show actual use at a later point in order to move that from intent to use to actual use to then permit registration, but that at least allows you to file under that basis. Now, one of the things to be aware of, almost as soon as you have filed your application, you're going to start receiving misleading notices. Why is this? It's because all information within your application becomes public information. Many of the notices that you receive will say that fees are required. Well, these are fees that are not required by the USPTO, but because these notices, they often look very official. In fact, some using wording such as Patent and Trademark Office based in Washington, D.C. Well, we are actually based in Alexandria, Virginia, but if you receive something from Patent and Trademark Office saying you are required to pay certain fees, it's understandable that sometimes you are misled. So, we have a whole web page devoted to these solicitations. If there's any question whether something is in fact from the USPTO, we always encourage you, please check first, call the USPTO, ask, is this legitimate? Unfortunately, because we have no connection with these operations, if you pay money to one of them, we unfortunately will not be able to help get your money back. Now, we obviously hope, as Liz said earlier, the goal of the USPTO is to move things to registration. But with that, always remember that although the mission of the USPTO is to register any mark that is eligible for registration, the USPTO, we are not an enforcement agency. We have no enforcement powers, and it is your responsibility as the owner of the registration to enforce your rights. One way to think of this is that the registration is a sword, not a shield. Just because you have the registration does not mean that someone else will not try to use a similar mark to infringe on your registration. And you can use a registration certificate to support a cease and desist letter. But again, it's going to be your responsibility to send that out. Now, once the mark is registered, there are post-registration requirements, unlike a patent or even a copyright that is only good for a set number of years, a trademark actually can last forever on our register as long as you take the steps to keep the registration alive. Between the fifth and sixth year after registration, it's due another filing that you are still using the mark in commerce. You could also combine that filing there at the second bullet with what is known as a Section 15 to claim that the mark is incontestable, that no one is able to challenge the validity of that mark. Between the ninth and 10th years, you have to do yet another filing called a Section 8 and 15, showing that you are still using the mark and to request renewal. And then every 10 years after the same requirement. Now, to help you with this, 
we do email reminder notices the first day of that fifth year period, the first day of the ninth year period, reminding you that another filing is due to keep your registration alive. So it's very important to keep your email address current with the USPTO. Finally, how can you find help? Well, obviously, the main way to find help today is through the USPTO website. On our website, we have a basic facts about trademarks booklet. Maybe you don't want to read a booklet, but you're able to watch videos. We have our basic facts about trademarks video series. We also have our TMIN video series. And finally, we have T's Nuts and Bolts, which will walk you through all the steps of the application. But sometimes always remember that your best resource may be an experienced trademark attorney with a footnote there that if you are not domiciled in the United States as of August of last year, you are actually now required to use a U.S. attorney. Finally there, noting what the USPTO does not do. We are not able to provide legal advice. We're not able to enforce legal rights. And we are not able to recommend specific private attorneys for you to use. Finally, our Trademark Assistance Center, either by phone or by email. And if you want to see more of what the Assistance Center is able to do to help you, they have a web page as noted there. And that concludes the actual presentation, but I think we have left time for some questions. Yes, so we, we do have a, a couple of minutes for questions, so I encourage uh, our listeners and our watchers to um, type those questions in. To, to get things started, um, I would like to ask Elizabeth a question. Um, with respect to, you mentioned that when you're filing uh, utility design or plant patents, um, in the U.S. that that covers the, the United States. Is there any relationship between the U.S. and other international patent um, systems? Um, is there any collaboration or um, shared information? So that's a great question, Lisa. Um, so again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I, I would repeat, there is no uh, worldwide patent, um, but one can protect your intellectual property uh, across the globe. There are intellectual property offices in virtually every country, uh, and we collaborate with a number of them um, because as our world becomes more global, we do work to harmonize patent laws, trademark laws, intellectual property laws in general as we are able to do so. There are several vehicles um, for collaboration, um, one of which is the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which assists individuals in uh, filing applications in countries uh, across the globe. Um, there are also other uh, collaborative efforts, one of which I would certainly encourage people to uh, visit our website to learn more about, and that is the Patent Prosecution Highway, which are um, uh, initiatives um, between countries which allow for expedited examination where similar applications are filed in more than one country and uh, the countries may take advantage of the search and examination work that is being done by another country. Um, we do, in talking about resources um, that are related to international filing, we do in fact have um, an Office of International Patent Cooperation within the USPTO, and they do have um, resources available to take direct one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, I would also, uh, uh, make mention that just anecdotally, um, from what we hear from our stakeholders, when determining where to file abroad, oftentimes our stakeholders have made the recommendation that they look to where they plan to manufacture their product, where they plan to sell their product, where their competitors are located. These oftentimes are their first locations in which they seek to protect on an international basis to protect in a country outside of the U.S. So again, that's just some anecdotal information um, that we've heard from stakeholders. But again, this is a great area of the law with some complexity 
where having a good registered patent attorney or patent agent could really come in handy. Thank you. That's, that's great advice. I, I want to, um, Craig, ask you a question. I, I found the discussion about the, the strengths and weaknesses of um, trademarks really fascinating, and, and your examples, I think, were, were really, um, were really, I think, very helpful. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, there can be the same trademark in different, um, in different market sectors. How separate do they have to be in order for there not to be considered an overlap? Remember that the keyword there is related. So they can be different, yet if they are somehow related, that could be a problem. To, to set back, um, to highlight the notion of identical marks, but there's not a problem. Dove for a bar of soap and Dove for an ice cream bar, the identical trademark Dove, yet clearly soap and ice cream different enough that there's no likelihood of confusion. They're entirely different companies. Entirely different companies but identical trademarks, but the public is not confused as to the source of the goods. Um, but uh, handbags and clothing items, for example, they're clearly different items, yet we're accustomed to designers creating both. So if a similar mark were used in those fields, then there's a problem. So it's really, you would think when you go into a store, are you used to seeing those goods sold in the same channels of trade, as long as it's not a big box store that would sell absolutely everything. But you kind of use your own experience to kind of think, oh, well, I, I've seen these goods sold in similar markets, so if I were to encounter uh, a similar trademark, I might be confused. Hey, I, um, Elizabeth, with, with respect to, um, you, you mentioned when you file an application, you can claim patent pending. Is, is there any protection associated with um, with that phrase? Not specifically. Um, it goes almost to what Craig was was referencing. You are putting the public on notice by using that term, and that term can be used any time you have an application pending within the office. And that's whether it's a provisional patent application or a non-provisional patent application. Now, once the prosecution has concluded and you no longer have an application pending, meaning your application has gone abandoned um, or you have had a patent issued, in the case of where a patent is issued, you'd use the indication of the U.S. patent number. Where you no longer have an application pending, to use the term patent pending would be misleading um, and could cause um, uh, actual uh, complication. So again, that term patent pending should only be used when there is a pending application of some type. And it does serve that notice function, but it cannot be used with when one is going, uh, one cannot use it as, as the, to use again Craig's term, uh, this, this word. Um, it's only once those rights are conveyed with an issued U.S. patent that one really has the opportunity to enforce the right, because that is only then that the right has been offered. Now, protection goes back to the earliest time of filing, so one does have that time period where the uh, term patent pending was used. And, and that's where trademarks is a little different. You can use the TM, the SM, regardless of whether you have or have not filed an application, and regardless of whether the USPTO ultimately grants, if we refuse, it doesn't mean you can't use the TM designation. It is still your trademark. You're never allowed to use the R in a circle if refused. And, and how long does it take typically in, in, in both cases to from, from the application stage to issuance? On the, the trademark side, uh, again, remembering that there are two possible filing bases already using or intend to use. If filed based on already using, it's about a year. Intent to use, you're actually controlling the time frame because you still have to show actual use. So we have no way of knowing that, but you have the right to request extension. So from the time you filed, you go through all of your extensions, it ends up maybe being about four years which is helpful because you may still be trying to get your financing, for example, but you have your rights based when you filed that application. Great. In the case of patents, um, 
what we call a first office action pendency, meaning how long is the time period from you filing an application to it being picked up for the first time by a U.S. patent examiner. Uh, we are currently running at about 15 to 16 months. Now, I say that's on average because it depends upon the technology in which you're filing. If you're filing in an area in which there's a high level of filings, um, it could be a longer period of time. If you're filing in an area where there are less applications being filed, it could be less. So it is, I, I caution people um, that that is an average. Now, our total pendency, meaning the time in which from filing to a final determination by the agency, that's currently running at about 24 months or two years. Now, one can actually check where we're at um, because we do like to be transparent with our stakeholders and with the public in general. Uh, on our website, we have a number of dashboards. We have one both for patents and trademarks and some of our other business units as well. And on those dashboards, and we use the term dashboard because it, it does look like a series of dials, like the dashboard of your car, um, we put forth on a regular basis where we are at with respect to things like our first office action pendency and our total pendency, because we do like to keep the public aware of where we are at with our processing time. That's great. Well, um, I think we've reached the end of our time here. So I, I first want to thank our guests. Thank you so much for your time today. I learned a lot. I, I hope that it was very useful to, to those of you who tuned in today as well. Um, I want to just point out that that this type of information sharing is exactly why we started the Nanotechnology Entrepreneurship Network. And, and we encourage folks who are interested to keep an eye on nano.gov for more information about events that are related to this network.